It costs millions of dollars to get to the lower half, $20 million to get to be a senator. In fact, most senators are, are, are millionaires. 
and they're not representative of you, and it costs $60 million to be president. And so you have to know that those people have had their soul bought before they get into the Congress, and they don't represent you, they represent the corporations. In your country, you all know that, is run by corporations and not by you. And even in your own state senate, I hear that they degraded the clean water bill, is that correct, so that this big uh, copper mining company can come in, you've got a huge super fund here, right in the middle of paradise. And that has to be changed. And the only people who can change it are you. The first is the story that I tell as a biologist, and it's my best attempt to outline and summarize all the lines of evidence that I believe are very persuasive in demonstrating that there is a profound link between environmental contamination on the one hand and rising rates of cancer on the other. Um, the other piece of living downstream is my own personal story as a cancer survivor myself. I was diagnosed with bladder cancer at the age of 20. I, I'm very happy to be here today, and I want to talk with you about some of the observations that my colleagues and I have made about the links between breast cancer and environment. But let me be very clear. It is still a puzzle. The links don't all necessarily fit together. But what I want to do in my remarks today is try to shift the public discussion to the things that you can do to reduce your risk, not just as individuals, but the things that we have to all work together in society, in the government, and in the private sector. We've got to change political reality. And that means every one of us in this room has to work every day to do that. We have to talk to our family members, our neighbors, and make them see what is going on. We need a revolution. And I know you're looking at me saying, a revolution? to start out with. This is Morgan Eichwald, and she's going to say what, what clean water means to her. Hi, my name is Morgan Eichwald. I'm a fifth generation Montanan, and I'm 10 years old. I won't be able to vote for eight years. By the time I'm able to vote, so the Blackfoot River could be ruined. And me and my family always go rafting and fishing down the Blackfoot River. And if I-122 doesn't go through, it'd be disgusting to go swimming in all the chemicals, and I wouldn't be able to eat the fish that I caught, and I'd be afraid of my dogs drinking the water. So go out there and vote for I-122. Thanks. <laughs>
need to show her a little respect, like you guys should sit up or something, and give her a big welcome. Here's Miss Janet Bruin. Across the world, 
included with anti-Semitism and ethnic violence and conflict and religious and racial conflict. There, one bright spot in the world that we see is the beginning of the dismantling of the apartheid system in South Africa. But elsewhere, and in the United States, and even here in Missoula and Montana, we see a kind of new wave of intolerance, disrespect, and violence. I've been living in Switzerland for the last 15 years, and I've had a very wonderful chance to learn more about history to learn about the work of the United Nations in the fields of disarmament, development, human rights, racism, the environment, justice, uh, and all of these questions. And in the work that I've been doing, I've learned about the United Nations uh, law, conventions, and declarations. And there is a whole body of UN conventions, declarations, and international law relating to the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination. There is a book which includes these documents, and we're going to find a way that Hellgate High School students can take the parts on racism, racial intolerance, and discrimination, and use them. I don't want you to be intimidated by the United Nations language. You take it sentence by sentence, and you try to make something of it, and it's our collective human history that's embodied in international law. And I just want to summarize some of the things, some of the premises of this law relating to racism. The first precept is that all people belong to a single species, that all of us form an integral part of humanity, that people have a right to be different, but this shouldn't serve as a pretext for racial prejudice. The law says that racist theories involving the claim of superiority or inferiority of a group, implying that one group has the right to dominate or even to eliminate others, have no scientific foundation, and that they're contrary to the moral and ethical principles of humanity. The conventions hold that racist ideologies Racist attitudes and behavior, racist structural arrangements and practices are against the principles of international law and that they disturb international peace and security. There is the idea also that racial and ethnic groups, foreigners and migrant workers who are socially or economically disadvantaged should all be given respect, security, equal protection of the law, and opportunity for full advancement. There is a call in these conventions and declarations for governments and the teaching profession to do everything they can to combat racism. They call on the media and those who control or serve the media to promote understanding, tolerance, and friendship. They call on all governments, organizations, and individuals to contribute to the struggle against racism, against racial segregation, against apartheid and genocide, and to deliver the peoples of the world from these scourges. I think it's very important for us to study these documents that are, have been put out by the United Nations and the UNESCO related to racism and to take action to help implement the, the spirit of these conventions and declarations. Now, the United Nations did just that. In 1972, the United Nations launched a decade for action to combat racism and racial discrimination. They followed that by a second decade in 1983. And this very year, in 1994, a third decade has just begun. Um, we had a meeting of non-governmental organizations in Geneva last September, which made some recommendations for action for use during the third UN decade um, to combat racism and racial discrimination. I have a summary of the recommendations of that meeting. We're going to leave several copies with the Respect Committee, with the Black Student Union, and with the teachers, and hopefully the parent-teacher association so that you can use these in the work that you're 
going to be doing over the next couple of years. Um, but now we're in the third decade to combat racism. And we have to ask why racism, after two decades already, is on the increase, despite all of this action that has gone on in the past. And why we see in every part of the world outbreaks of racial, ethnic, and religious conflict and intolerance. And we have to think about what we, every single one of us, can do to stop it. And the best place to start is when you're young. I want to tell you about a special friend of mine, an older Dutch woman who's Jewish. When she was your age in 1941, the Nazis invaded her country, Holland. Now, when I say Nazis and Hitler, do all of you know what I'm talking about? Just raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about, the Nazis and Hitler. Because in Germany some years ago, they did a, 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 a survey, and they found that there were young people who thought that Hitler was a basketball player. But it's very important for all of us to know who the Nazis and Hitler were. Miriam was 15 years old or so, and because she was Jewish, she had to go into hiding for a couple of years in the Dutch countryside. Now she's in her late 60s, and she goes to schools and talks to young people with anti-fascist exhibits. If I had known when I was coming here, I would have tried to bring a packet of what she uses to display at high school. And I'm going to try to send one to you, even though you might not understand the Dutch. Uh, it, it's interesting nonetheless, because it is, um, she explains to young people how Nazism and fascism begins with ideas, ideas in your mind, about racial superiority. In this case of Germany, the Aryan master race. Now, does that word ring a bell? Aryan master race. You have right in your neighborhood this white Aryan nation that has very similar ideas. The Aryan master race. And she points out that the intention of the Nazis with this idea of their superiority was to exterminate entire groups of people. They started with the communists and the socialists and the trade unionists. They exterminated people who had physical disabilities, homosexuals, Jews, gypsies, and other non-Aryan people. And they colonized and enslaved other groups of people like the Slavs of Eastern Europe. These ideas led to millions of corpses in the gas chambers at Auschwitz and other concentration camps and killing fields all over Europe. And yet, 50 years later, 50 years after the defeat of Hitler and after the defeat of Nazism, racism and xenophobia are leading to murder of foreigners in many places in Europe. Jewish cemeteries are being desecrated. Gypsies are being harassed and deported. Turkish people who have been working in Germany and other European countries are, are being uh, burned in their hostels and people are being killed. You know, in Eastern Europe, you all know about what's happening in the former Yugoslavia. People who used to live in peace together, maybe they had historical grudges, but they managed to live together without killing each other. They're now fighting, they're murdering, they're destroying their cities and towns and villages, and all of this took so long to build in human history, and now it's being destroyed. In Africa, there is a new outbreak of tribal conflict. There's religious conflict in India. Almost everywhere you look, you see people are somehow fighting with each other. And here in the United States, so much of the progress that the civil rights movement made is being reversed. You have this white Aryan resistance that was held responsible for beating a black student to death at the hands of three young skinheads. The brutal beating of Rodney King that the whole world saw on television <coughs> and the, the acquittal of the police. The gay bashing murder of a sailor in the United States Navy. More recent 
plays a cute box clown put up a cross in Ohio at Christmas time. Right here in Missoula, apparently, some people have been beaten in the streets because they have a different skin color from white. And I was just on the Flathead Indian Reservation and learned that there are white farmers there who refuse to accept that the Indians are sovereign in that tribal area after so many decades of, of oppression and the genocide that was done to the Native American people. So we have to ask, oh, and then something that was just revealed by the Department of Energy. Going back a long time, but I think part and parcel of this history of racism that we have in the country. The revelations um, showing that the, uh, that, that Seven newborn babies were injected with radioactive fire, six of them black children, in the 1950s. And similar experiments, I think they put radioactive elements in the cereal of 19 children with mental re retardation. So these, this is a pattern, it's a history, and it's something that we have to come to terms with and change. And we have to ask what's happening to humanity. Why do we have all this intolerance? Why is this racism and violence on the increase? The leader of an extreme right-wing political party in Germany, who himself served in the Nazi army 50 years ago, put it very clearly. He said the growing anxiety about jobs and the millions of people who are unemployed will help us. Hate groups like his political party, like the White Aryan Nation, like the Ku Klux Klan, and many other little groups that are growing up here and elsewhere, they thrive on economic insecurity and unemployment. I saw the unemployment figures for the state of Montana, and there are some areas that have 16, more than 16% unemployment, where the young people will grow up and probably never have a job. Missoula has a lower unemployment rate, but you usually have to add a couple of percentage points to the official figures to come up with the true unemployment rate. And people who don't have work or people who are insecure or afraid of losing their jobs are real easy to manipulate. People who are hurting economically, people who have never been educated, who have never had an exposure to real multicultural education and understanding. It's always easy to make them think that somebody else is responsible for their problem. The other one, it's the black, it's the Jews, it's the Hispanic, it's the Indian, or the foreigners, or the gays, or the women. They're the ones responsible for your own insecurity. And it's very easy to manip manipulate people who are insecure into hating a whole other group who they don't know very well. And once this, this feeling, these feelings of superiority over the other are instilled, violence is often not far behind. And that's why I think schools and the mass media have such a great responsibility in educating people to respect each other and to combat prejudice and discrimination. I want to say something about the mass media because it's so important in our lives. Uh, Senator Simon, several years ago, had something in the newspaper that I cut out and I memorized because I was dumbfounded by the statistics. It said that the average American watches seven and a half hours of television a day. Are any of you in this average? Do any of you watch seven hours of television a day? Okay, some of you watch more than seven hours of television a day? Some of you do. Well, I'm glad most of you don't, but it's something that we have to think about. Because according to Senator Simon, by the time you finish high school, you have seen 200,000 acts of violence on television. And of those 200,000 acts of violence, 50,000 of them were murders. And you eat your breakfast in front of the television, or you eat your dinner in front of the television, or it's always there in the background. So this kind of thing conditions you. And it makes you feel that this is normal, that this is part of life, that you accept it, and you accept the violence that is growing part of the society, and you accept it in foreign policy, and you come to 
cheer when U.S. airplanes are bombing people in Iraq and the president's popularity goes up, instead of thinking, couldn't it have been possible to negotiate, to mediate, to talk with the Iraqis, to uh, settle any of the conflicts we might have had with the Iraqi people without violence, to come to some kind of non-violent resolution of conflict. My organization in Australia has put a lot of thought into this, and they have a series of, I think, 12 or 15 days on learning uh, non-violent conflict resolution. We will see if we can get a set of those tapes for Hellgate High School. But these are the kinds of things that the media are really conditioning us to accept. I want to give an example from another country, from India, where they have something called Star TV, owned by Rupert Murdoch, you know, the Italian, the Australian, I think he is, billionaire. There are some places, some villages in India that don't have schools, but they have television sets. And the Star TV comes into these people's households, kind of invades their households, and it gives them images that are consumerist, fantastic, escapist, consumption-oriented, um, and, and these people can't have these things because most Indians are very poor, and they're getting poorer because of the workings of the international economy. And then they have a very unjust caste system that keeps people inferior. And a lot of this frustration from the poverty and from seeing this media and seeing things that exist but they can't have makes people very frustrated. And frustration can easily be manipulated by religious fundamentalists. So you have, I know last year you probably saw it on television. It's important to see what's happening in the world on television. Not all of television is bad, and it's important for us to understand Hindu versus Muslim fundamentalists fighting in the streets. It's very easy to manipulate this kind of frustration. In Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia, there was another example of intellectuals, of journalists, of academicians, professors, who coined a whole new language of racial superiority and the inferiority of other groups, so that young people were sent out to fight with the, with the uh, journalist words on their lips. Coming back to the situation in the United States, something more recent, I was in the country uh, at the time of the upheaval in Los Angeles in 1992. And I was in New York at the time, and I was walking through the streets, and a group, a large group, of young people were marching through the streets shouting, no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace. And those kids were angry, and I understand why they were angry, because the way things are going, they don't see a great future for themselves. As long as there's racism, as long as people are deprived of equal rights, as long as young people feel they don't have much of a future, as long as they have little hope of finding jobs, we are setting the stage for this kind of upheaval and instability. We're setting the stage for violence, for crime, for escapism through drugs, and for more social unrest. And in a society like the United States, which is the richest country in the history of the world, it is simply inexcusable that we have a couple of million homeless people, that 39 million people don't have health coverage, that 35 million people at least are living in poverty, that 29%, 28% of the nation's children are among those who live in poverty, and that hunger is on a sharp increase. And that's why we have to change this country and we have to change the world. This is not going to be easy. But awareness is the first step. And events like this very one at Hellgate High School, discussions in your classroom, talking with your family and friends, joining or forming groups like the Respect Committee, the Black Student Union, and other organizations to deal with these questions is how we should continue. For me, knowing that there are young people like you doing the same kind of thing in all parts of the world gives me a lot of hope. I want to share with you something I did see on television. I have the cable, so I get CNN in my apartment in Switzerland. 
I saw an interview with a group called Sharp. Have you heard of Sharp here? I think maybe it's back east. Skinheads Against Racial Prejudice, Sharp. These are young skinheads. They like the hairstyle, they like the music, but they don't like racism and they don't like violence. And they distribute leaflets and they talk to people against racism. I met the grandmother of one of these kids on the East Coast a couple of weeks ago, and boy was she proud of her grandson. Another thing I want to share about young people who are doing great things is in Germany. You know, I told you about the racism and xenophobia that's going on there and the murder of foreigners. Last fall, a million Germans took to the streets. They came from the churches and the trade union organizations, from women's organizations, and there were entire classes of young people, entire elementary school and junior high school and high school classes, coming out to the streets with candles saying, never again fascism, never again war, never again racism. And I think if we all work together, we can build a peaceful, non-racist non world. We can build a world where everybody has productive employment, where everybody has equality of opportunity, where all people participate in decision making, where we learn to use our leisure time creatively. We can build a society not based on arms production and war, where resources are used for schools and health care and housing, for human development, for leisure time activities, and where everyone has what they need and the surplus is fairly shared. We can build a society where people can live together peacefully, despite their differences. Where people get to know each other and respect the history and traditions, the poetry, the culture, the music, and the food, and the glory of other groups. Where education teaches respect for all people and prepares everybody for global understanding, for global responsibility, for solidarity and cooperation, where we learn the history of slavery and genocide, the history of oppression and exploitation, and a kind of educational system where each one of us pledges that we're not going to let that go on, not in our name. I believe that we can build a society based on love and compassion and empathy, justice, beauty, respect for each other, respect for all human rights, and care and concern for all people and nature. I believe we can do it together. I believe it starts with every single one of us. And I believe that each one of us has a very special responsibility in this regard. I think this is the most important work of the whole world. And I wish you success in the coming years as you explore these problems in depth. I want to say again, Happy New Year. I hope this year will be the year that all of us will change the world. James Madison stated in the Federalist Papers, Liberty is to fashion what air is to fire, an element without which 
and instantly expired. But it could not be less folly say, to abolish liberty, which is essential to political life because it nourishes faction, than it would be to wish the annihilation of air, which is essential to animal life because it imparts to fire its destructive agent. In other words, Madison is clearly saying that there can be no freedom without difference. Therefore, cultural differences, rather than being the enemy of a free society, according to Madison, are actually its friends. And without the coexistence of these cultural differences. Madison suggests that the society will cease to be free. Liberty, he says, is to faction what air is to fire, an element without which it instantly expires. Today, this notion of liberty as inclusive and as tolerant of different views is understood by those who claim by their by their by those who claim to be in continuity with the founding fathers. They are, however, in my opinion, simply constitutional revisionists still fighting anti-federalist debate of the 18th century. The problem is, however, that American, Americans can ill afford in this present time a repeat of the never-ending debate between the liberal and the conservative. For the issue of equal access is no longer up for debate. It will not be silenced by the deceived executive, judicial, and, cong and congressional check and balance system controlled by the rich and the powerful, while pretending to provide true democratic representation and equal opportunity for all. Those days are over. The imperative for all who love liberty today is to call for more economic inclusion. We can no longer hide or ignore the fact of rampant disproportionality in this country. We can no longer hide behind our blind platitudes about America, the beautiful. While people sleep on the streets, children are left to fend for themselves, young inner city men and women without a chance to live march endlessly off to death camps that we call prison. For example, 47.5% of the entire prison population of this country are African Americans while one half of the male prison population are African Americans. This is in the light of the fact that African Americans are only 12% of the population. At the core of the issue of equal access is ultimately the question of capacity. For equal access, should be equal capacity unless you throw into the equation the issue of diminished capacity. About two years ago, after giving a speech in defense of gay rights, after marching through Main Street, Seattle, at the front of a gay rights march, 
not one of those gay rights marches where you have the upper middle income gay marches. You have
do this by working together to create an environment of freedom, an environment of freedom that will liberate us from the tyranny of our present system of social and economic apartheid, a system maintenance by the monopoly of race and privilege, a system which preserves itself by feeding on our innate apprehension about our differences, a system that teaches us about a world where nothing is necessarily interrelated. It makes us feel that we can actually be islands unto ourselves. However, Jeremy Rifkin reminds us that we must view reality as an integrated system. He says, this self-correcting, circularity blurs the distinction between cause and effect. We must work together to create such a system, resisting the temptation to choose between the manipulated process of the 21st, of the 20th century. We must understand that it is not a question of either or, but what works for the people, for as high as being right, stability and order are not the only desirable conditions of social life. There is also justice, meaning the fair treatment of all human beings, the equal rights of all people to be free and to have prosperity. The answer is given, he says, in democratic theory is best. In the words of Jefferson and his colleagues in the Declaration of Independence, law is only the means. Government, government is only a means. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, these are to be our ends. And whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government. In the quote. Ironically, today, as in the beginning of America, the most vocal enemy against this kind of partnership for equal access are the churches. For just as the church during slavery used its privilege to defend the indefensible, today it seeks to do the same. The religious zealotry, this religious zealotry, can be vividly seen in the abortion clinic murder, which the Republicans and which the church never says anything about. And the rash of African American church bombings that now grip our nation. I recently visited Chicago. There I met a young African American minister from a call Mississippi. Church burned down on Saturday night. This is a young man full of energy and zeal. He only had 30 members. He had just started a school in his church. As he said and talked, he told me that he got up Sunday morning, drive to the rural area where his church was. When he got there, he was gone. As he sat there, other members began to drive up. One by one, power began to grip their faces. One of the things that he shared with me, no policeman called him, no fire official called him. They just left him drive that morning the distance to their church to find the record. One of the most revealing things he said to me he thought is that even today in Mississippi you simply know you simply know what you can do what you can say. You simply know what you can't do, what you can't say. You just know it. The 
not matter to me whether Ralph Reed, or Snap Robinson, are actually pulling the trigger or setting the fire. There can be little doubt, doubting the fact that their preaching of intolerance and the need to politically force these Christian values have played a role in arousing the maniacal religious fervor of those who would play God in this country. But they have planted the seeds of intolerance. And they have watered them. They have done this by using the poor people's money, money obtained by exchanging television, televised blessings for monthly payment schedules. Money which is then laundered to feed the dragon of right-wing extremism which seeks to hold hostage our political system. They have truly become America's ayatollahs. Their world is the world where gays are outlawed and back in the closet. Women are back in the kitchen and having abortions in Africa. African Americans act like Uncle Ben, the white-haired, elderly African American on the 700 Club. Uncle Ben just laughs and bows as a proof to the pompous, arrogant, self-righteous pronouncement of Master Robinson. Buffalo Bob Robinson and Howdy Judy Reed. Have turned the court for the storm of religious intolerance now sweeping across this country. They have helped to turn religion into a den of thieves, a place where immoral politicians like Newt Gingrich or criminals like Oliver North can bear the point their corrupt fingers of accusation as those they deem unearned. Whether it is innocent welfare mothers struggling to raise their children, or gay men and women fighting for equal rights. Whether it is people of color seeking opportunity by crossing our borders, or inner city residents demanding their fair share. These self-styled holiness have left none of them feeling safe in America in the wake, in the wake of their religious blitzkrieg. And now we know, or at least I know, why they have traded on to the Iron Coast. It has something to do with birds of a feather flocking together. It is. It is in addressing precisely this kind of right-wing health discussion that the civil rights movement was so successful. For as Martin so eloquently put it, the determination of the Negro American to win freedom from every form of oppression springs from the same profound longing for freedom that motivates oppressed people all over the world. He goes on to say, privileged groups rarely give up their privileges without strong resistance. But when oppressed people rise up against oppression, there is no stopping point short of poor freedom. When Martin spoke those these words, the struggle of the African American people in America was the center of the world for all nonviolent struggle for human self-determination. It was to this magnetic field of non for nonviolent action, of nonviolent action for justice, that all other similar struggles were drawn, giving birth to an explosion of free expression that continues even today to rock the world. We must now return to what works. We must return to an integrated system of consolidated a, a consolidated strategic plan. But during the civil rights era, integration was not just the goal for people. It was the methodology for struggle. The integration of people without the integration of concern and of methodology is no integration at all. It is what, it, it is what presently exists in this country. 
having the effect of creating the Clarence Thomas city, a belief that somehow the struggle of one man excuses continued indifference towards the thousands left behind. For example, Clarence Thomas cannot be understood outside of his complete capitulation to the demands of the rich and the powerful population, demonstrated by his virtual desertion of the bridge that brought him over. Thomas became perfect and now despises Kuta Kente. But Kuta Kente still lives and is now demanding economic justice. Therefore, it seems to me that the key to creating an environment for equal access must begin by awakening those now trapped by poverty to their collective power. Poverty can no longer be for us an unsolvable problem and the poor, dispensable commodity. Solutions to poverty must become opportunities, and poor people must be seen as those who can control that world of opportunity. The organization, the Black Dollar Day Task Force, the organization, our organization is committed to this struggle. Michael Porter at Harvard University School State, my ongoing research at Harvard University Business School identified four main advantages of the inner city. Strategic location, local market demand, integration with regional clusters, and human resources. This can be interpreted to mean that the poor are already in position to change the destiny of things if they are ever awakened to their collective power. Let's take first the issue of developing human resources. Like Mark, our plan must involve what he calls creative tension. This kind of tension is created today non-violently only around the issue of the control of money. Poor people are not poor because they have no money, but because they don't control their money. Therefore, we must create institutions controlled by the poor that control the distribution of the money that belongs to the poor. The freedom riders of the 21st century will be those who enter into both profit and non-profit partnerships with these new collective actions, creating the means to both economically protest by raiding the stock of outlaw corporations and to provide economic alternatives to corporate indifference by creating inner city businesses controlled by the inner city people themselves. We seek to do this in the task force by replacing marching seats with marching dollars, with forming endowment funds controlled by the people, with interest dollars being used to take care of the people's needs, and endowment dollars being used to leverage on behalf of the people's interests, as well as creating a way station where self-awareness and assessment go hand in hand with job and career training. Also, monthly job support groups meet to both encourage each other and to consolidate their collective power with caseworkers taking a back seat to group accountability and responsibility for itself. Secondly, support is point about strategic location. It is vital to speed up the mobilization of human resources in order to circumvent the rise of gentrification of our inner city corridors. Poor people are now positioned to control by their very presence alone most of our inner city. We must give to them the means. It is urgent that we give them the means to buy property and control investment opportunities through for-profit and non-profit partnerships with guaranteed both vested interests and jobs, for it is my belief that the ultimate solution to a global society is the creation of self, of small, interrelated communities tied together by their self-contained economic systems that create an inevitable ocean controlled 
by community-based tributaries or money. It is these self-sustained economic systems that come together to create the regional clusters that Porter talks about. We, the members of the human family, must understand that we can no longer afford the luxury of independent agenda as a people. We must act as one. The time has come for the foot bone of unified action to connect with the leg bone of perpetual organizing. We must walk together. We must learn how to act as one, one body. We must allow the hip bone of homosexuality and sexual freedom to unite with the backbone of worker rights and equal opportunity. We must stop our bickering, stop our classism, stop our contextual, myopic understandings of reality, and act as one. We must work together. We must work together and connect the backbone of worker rights and equal opportunity to the shoulder bone of corporate burden bearing. We must stand tight, organize, work together, build businesses together. We must act as one. Let now the next bone of mutual support connect us all to the head bone of justice for all. And then we can march together, as Martin called upon us to do, play together, sing together, stay together. This is the reality that must fuel our 21st century passion. Therefore, let the fires now burn away the defiant prejudices of the ages. We must do this for the sake of our future and that of our children. Let these fires of righteous action meet in a firestorm, the fires of hatred and indifference that now rage against the people of America and of the world. And in their coming together, create an end, a final end to the destruction and a new beginning for freedom and justice for all. Thank you. We're going to begin. Just take a minute to sit down, settle down for our keynote speech. 
I want you to all know I'm on my tiptoes. If I can stand on my tiptoes all night, you can be quiet. <laughs> Okay, let's find out who's here first. Give everybody a minute to settle down. First of all, if you've noticed, we have quite a few young people with us. Could we maybe get them to stand up and give them a hand? A lot of them have been with us since Friday, have really hung in there and added a lot to our conference and to the workshops, I've heard. Let's see, who's here from Oregon? Uh-oh. Who's here from Washington? How about Montana? Idaho? <laughs> Wyoming? You get an A for effort. How about Colorado? <laughs> You'll probably win next year. Did we miss anybody? How about California? Yeah, I thought so. Alaska? Delaware? Say, Delaware. How about uh, New York? Yeah, somebody from New York. Kansas City? Lenny? Okay. <laughs> Great to have you all here. This is our 10th annual conference. Welcome all. Thank you for your patience. We're going to start the program now. We're going to give some awards to some very special people. To start that off, I'm proud to introduce Eric Ward, who's the Associate Director of the Coalition, who's going to pr uh, present the first award. Good evening, everyone. Each year since 1987, the Northwest Coalition Against Malicious Harassment has presented the Baird Rustin Civil Rights Award to an outstanding leader in the field of human rights. The award is presented in the memory of Baird Rustin, a nationally prominent civil rights leader who died just several months after the Northwest Coalition was formed in 1987. Baird Rustin, born in 1912, life spanned a turbulent and remarkable era of civil rights in the United States. In 1947, Rustin took part in the first Freedom Ride from Virginia to Kentucky. On six occasions in three states, members of the group were arrested. Baird Rustin wrote, freedom can be, can be built only on a democratic structure in which each person is treated with dignity, and that the maintenance and the defense of those values require unremitting vigilance. For if not us, who? And if not now, when? In regards to those words that Baird Rustin wrote, something comes to mind of a person who lives those thoughts. In my eight years of organizing against the far right in the Northwest, this person has been a constant source of inspiration and support. I remember when I first started doing this work, in fact, stumbling around, getting organizational names wrong, the names of figures in the far right. This was the person who helped me to reach and to strive beyond simple analysis and to work hard, in fact, to try to understand the underlying issues involved in the far right in the United States. Leonard Zeskin is the president of the Institute for Research and Education on Human Rights, the author of numerous background reports, articles, and publications. Zeskin is considered one of the foremost experts on hate group activity nationally and internationally. Leonard Zeskin was also the recipient of the Columbia University School of Journalism's prestigious Paul Tobinkin Award for his contribution to a series of articles on the far right for the Washington Spokesman Review. Recent articles have appeared in Rolling Stone and The Village Voice. From 1987 to 1994, 
Leonard Zeskin served as the research director of the Center for Democratic Renewal and authored several monographs which have shaped our work in combating bigotry in the Northwest. These works include Christian Identity, a Theological Justification for Racist and Anti-Semitic Violence, which was published by the National Council of Churches of Christ in the USA. In addition to these many tasks, Leonard Zeskin has served as a consultant for a wide variety of organizations and individuals, from the American Jewish Committee, British Television, and the Coalition for Human Dignity, to name a few. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored that the Northwest Coalition Against Malicious Harassment is proud to present the Baird Rustin Award to Leonard Zeskin in recognition of his courageous dedication to civil rights. Thank, thank you, Eric, and thank you, Bill, and Jeanette, and everybody from the Northwest Coalition. This is a very nice award. I've seen other people get it, and I know it means something, and I'm, I'm very uh, honored and a little flabbergasted. And for those of you who know me, uh, know that I'm not short of words. And tonight I'm short of words. Um, I'm supposed to say something now, they said. Uh, and yeah, um, I'll say this, that I was uh, very honored to be part of the process that uh, pulled this uh, organization together. It was a much smaller group in the beginning than it is tonight. I think that's proof of the dedication of the board and staff of the Northwest Coalition. It shows that they take their work seriously and have built a very strong and magnificent organization that's a real true coalition. I've also been honored to be able to work with them in cities all, and towns all over the Northwest. Uh, some of my more memorable occasions have been in Pocatello, Idaho, in Knoxon, Montana, before John Trockman became famous, in Billings, Spokane, Seattle, Eugene, Boise. It's been, uh, and it's been an important part of my life to be able to come up here and from Kansas City where I live and be part of this, which is really a very big and important human rights movement that I think is having an impact nationally on the human rights movement uh, in this country. So I'm very honored. Uh, I can't really say anything more. I just thank you very much. In my uh, zeal to get everybody seated, I'm reminded I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jeanette Pius Spinoza. I'll be your MC tonight, and I'm president of the coalition. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce the very special Bill Wasmuth, director of the coalition, who will talk to us about the next award. About two years ago, the Northwest lost a very important person. Uh, who was a champion for human rights, a champion for human rights within the law enforcement community, 
and within the broader community as well. Larry Broadbent was under sheriff of Kootenai County during the 80s and was a strong uh, force against the Aryan nation, became recognized as an expert um, on that issue and did uh, trainings for law enforcement around the country. He was also a champion in terms of the community at large. He was on the board of directors of the Kootenai County Task Force. He was on the board of directors of the Northwest Coalition Against Malicious Harassment. When Larry Broadbent passed away about two years ago, the board of directors of the Northwest Coalition determined that they wanted to establish an award in his memory and in his honor and have established the award that we want to present for the first time tonight uh, in memory of Larry Broadbent and to honor a member of the criminal justice system in the Northwest who has likewise shown great courage, great sensitivity to human rights, and great respect for their role in the criminal justice system. And here to present that award is Susan DeCamp from the Montana Association of Churches. Thank you very much. When the Northwest Coalition um, asked me to present this award to Nicholas Mernion, a Garfield County attorney in Montana, I was so excited because you made a wonderful choice. Nick Mernion, as Garfield County attorney, has, has provided an outstanding example, much in the same tradition as Larry Broadbent. And as I listened to Bill describe Larry Broadbent, I thought, wow, it sounds just like Nick. Nick is, um, Garfield County is a county that's about the size of a lot of states I can think of. It's huge. And they have one part-time county attorney. And they have one sheriff. When the Freemans took over the county courthouse, it was up to Nick and that county sheriff to tell the Freemen to leave. And when the Freemen broke the law, it was Nick who prosecuted them. Nick took it upon himself to read those Freeman documents to research the movement, to research Christian identity. And by the time the Montana Human Rights Network contacted Nick to offer their assistance, he was already an expert. It was Nick who kept the pressure on federal law enforcement to come in and do something about the Freeman. And to the tremendous relief of the residents and the neighbors of the Freeman in Jordan, and he himself was the target of many threats, intimidation, there was a bounty placed on his head, dead or alive, by the Freeman. But in Nick's own words, he has a little trouble standing down. <laughs> so in the very best tradition of the Western frontier, Nicholas Mernion is a true hero. And I'm so delighted, particularly as a Montanan, that the Northwest Coalition has chosen to honor our Garfield County attorney. And I'm so sorry he couldn't be here tonight, but that's just like Nick. So thank you very, very much.